G'day, I'm Alex Bainbridge. Welcome to The Green F Show. Today we're going to be talking about stopping violence against women and domestic and domestic violence coming out of the second round of national mobilizations organized by What Were You Wearing? Before we, do, before we get underway, I do want to acknowledge that this uh, episode of The Green F Show is produced on stolen First Nations country, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Also, if you like the work that we do, please become a Green Left supporter if you're not already. It is the number one way to both support our work and also to receive the content that we produce. Uh, plans start from just $5 a month uh, and you can find out more at the Green Left website. There's a link in the description for this video or podcast. As I said, today we're going to be talking about stopping violence against women. A little over a week ago, we saw the second round of mobilizations organized by What Were You Wearing? Uh, in April, tens of thousands of people, absolutely huge mobilizations, people poured onto the streets to express their disgust with the, the rampaging epidemic of murders of women, uh, often by intimate partners, by, by men. And uh, this is obviously an, you know, an important issue that needs to be dealt with. Uh, since then, however, uh, we haven't seen very much uh, action from the government. So I actually wanted to ask, I wanted to begin by asking Sarah Williams, who is the national, uh, one of the national organisers and the founder of What Were You Wearing? Why were these rallies organised? Yeah, so we organised the rallies because 54 women have been murdered um, by the hands of men's violence in Australia and not enough is being done. Um, I said this quite a bit, but enough is enough and I think you know, it has been enough for quite some time um, and we're not seeing enough change like we would like. I think we need funding for frontline services, specialist services in the domestic, family and sexual violence sector. We need funding for men's behaviour change programs and women's refuges as well. Um, but we need commitments on things like our trauma-informed care petition, um, on, you know, bail laws um, and a whole range of things that people across the whole country are advocating for. I also asked Sarah to talk about the Believe Me campaign which was profiled at these rallies. Yeah, so the hashtag Believe Me campaign is a campaign I started. I experienced some pretty horrific police misconduct in 2023 and I really wanted to start a campaign where we encourage people to believe victims because not believing victims and asking a victim blaming question like what were you wearing or how much did you have to drink can really stunt someone's you know healing journey and the last thing I want and I know it happens far too often is that People are going into their police stations or their hospitals wanting to get help, expecting to be protected by the first responders, but unfortunately aren't. Journalist Nicole Madigan spoke at the McGangin or Brisbane rally on July 28. She summarised what's happened in the last three months, including government inaction and the ongoing murder of women. It's been three months since we last came together to march against gendered violence, against women being murdered and controlled and hurt and humiliated most often by men they know and love, but almost always by men. That rally was incredible to witness as this one is today, and I'm so thankful for what we were wearing for organising such a powerful event. But there was one blemish at the April event. As our Prime Minister continued to speak to the crowd, while the rally's organiser, Sarah, who spoke today, became visibly emotional and distressed just metres from where he stood, it became really quite clear that despite our collective noise, when it comes to the men who have the power to generate change, our demands and our pleas are falling on deaf ears. What happened in that moment was a symbolic visual demonstration of this, but we only need to take a look at what happened next. Since that rally just three months ago, a further 21 women and four children have been murdered as a result of male violence many of those by a current or former partner. Nicole Madigan also spoke about the lack of funding in this year's budget. In the 2023-24 budget, the government pledged, pledged to extend its existing leading violence program and invested money into combating online misogyny and AI pornography. While any and all initiatives are welcome, the announcement was further proof that the government is not really listening not to those with lived experience who know what they're facing and who know what they need. I also asked Sarah to say what she thought about the government's uh, budget response. I think the $925 million that was committed in the national budget, where it was like the $5,000 escape um, in violence payments, is pretty mismal. Um, we've heard from a lot of victim survivors that haven't been able to access it 
aren't eligible or aren't able to find the service to help them get it. Um, and also $5,000 is not enough for a mum with children trying to escape a domestic violence relationship. You know, to find cost of living crisis, housing crisis, you know, everything is so, you know, messed at the moment. You know, $5,000 unfortunately is nowhere near enough to help someone properly be able to escape. Um, we need, you know, the funding into our consent and healthy relationships education. We need it into specialist services. We need to be educating men where the, you know, we need to be educating it where the problem is as well. So it'd be like changing men's behaviour that are doing the wrong thing. Coming out of the 2024 budget, some representatives of organisations supporting survivors of sexual assault or domestic violence said they might need to wind back services because of the lack of government funding. Women and Children First CEO Gabrielle Morrissey told the ABC that the government's budget simply reallocated funding within the sector, which amounted to nothing more than trickery and deception. It's total trickery and deception. That's what we got in this federal budget. A big old gaslight. Did you actually think we were going to get new dollars for domestic violence and women's safety? in the federal budget? Oh, no, 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 you misunderstood. Oh, no, you didn't hear the what I said really correctly. No, not new money, reallocated money. Probably more significant than the direct funding for domestic violence services, the budget also failed to provide meaningful answers to the housing crisis or the fact that welfare recipients, especially people forced to rely on job seeker, are living in literal poverty. These are the key obstacles for women trying to escape violence. In terms of things like uh, job seeker, youth allowance and those payments, there's definitely they're definitely nowhere near the amount they should be. Um, you know, about seven hundred a week on youth allowance for fortnight is nowhere near enough to live. It's pretty much covers rent, let alone all your food expenses and, you know, just living. Let alone if you're trying to escape domestic violence, you might not be able to work that week. You might need to get extra help from a doctor, psychologist. If you're not able to access this, that eight, like $700 a fortnight is not going to get you anywhere. And I think that the rates of, you know, these services need to go up, um, like the funding amount. And, yeah, we need more, we need more homes and you know, homes for people to be able to live in and escape to as well. I also had the opportunity to speak to Mary Beck councillor and a Socialist Alliance member, Sue Bolton, coming out of the first round of mobilisations. I asked her about the government's budget failures on public housing and job seeker. Yes, actually that is a very good question. That is scandalous that the government is trying to distract people from the fact they still refuse to lift job seeker in any meaningful way um, by with this electricity rebate which goes to everybody and you know sure that's good to have that electricity rebate but it is most desperate for people on Centrelink payments whether they're well especially job seeker but also single parent disability support age pension as well, all of these payments need to be lifted above the poverty line. Um, in the case of JobSeeker, that would mean doubling or more than doubling JobSeeker. It's just scandalous um, and it actually forces women into vulnerable situations where women have to live in houses where they might have to provide sex or other services in order to be able to afford a roof over their head or their children's heads. So it's, um, it's absolutely scandalous. And this actually is part of women having the economic means to make choices. And the same with the lack of housing, the lack of public housing, where governments have been systematically demolishing public housing and not replacing it, let alone not increasing it, and just letting the market decide to do whatever they want, which is um, jack up rents way, way, way beyond inflation. And then I think the other thing that factors into all of this is the fact that the government has, over many years, especially since the 1980s, 
been privatising services or outsourcing public services to not-for-profits, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, means more responsibility for a member of the household unit, which is usually women because of sexism and, and the position of women in society. And so that then also takes women out of the workforce or forces women to work part-time because it's usually women who accept that responsibility. And really that's an other element of the lack of equality for women is that when women take time out of the workforce for sh caring responsibilities, whether because they've had children or they have to look after other people's children or they have to look after elderly parents or a member of the family who might have a disability, um, that is, they're not compensated for that. The compensation for that is lower wages and less job security and living in poverty for all of their lives. So there is a reason why the term feminisation of poverty um, exists because you know, women shouldn't take the burden of the fact that they have the ability to give birth. Um, there's nothing genetic that says that other people in society, men, um, <laughs> um, can't look after elderly parents or people with disabilities or, or children. Um, but women, because of sexism, uh, feel that responsibility. So government policies of privatisation also have an impact. Not everyone with a disability is accepted into the NDIS scheme. So a lot of people have disabilities um, who need support from other family members and friends and so forth um, because they're not getting that support from NDIS or the state government. A lot of elderly people who have disabilities, they're not eligible for the NDIS scheme. So they're not eligible for those supports despite having a disability. The various in-home aged care schemes, which have, are mostly privately operated now, just like NDIS is privately operated, um, aren't eligible for supports when they have physical disabilities. So that is also an extra burden um, for women. So housing, lack of, you know, um, adequate Centrelink payments, unequal wages, being penalised for taking time out for, um, for looking after members of the family unit who need support, and also the privatisation of public services putting more burden on women. Uh, similarly, I spoke to Renee Lees, who was then working in the area uh, on the question of the, of the budget failure on housing and job seeker. Yeah, absolutely. Housing and poverty uh, are, are, are huge. Uh, you know, we're not giving women and kids who are going through this stuff, they don't currently have, um, for the most part, an opportunity, a real chance of leaving, of, of getting on and rebuilding their lives because of the lack of housing and, and, and the fact that uh, most of them will be in poverty for a long time afterwards. Um, it, it happens... Um, certainly in the courts, it's I see that all the time that uh, women are staying in relationships that are not healthy for themselves or the kids, or on the other hand, where men have been ousted through domestic violence orders, uh, they have nowhere to go to either, and that is also creating a more desperate situation there, which is not making anybody safer either. Uh, the... Um, you know, and there's, um, you know, the, the as I said, the, the capacity of crisis shelters is nowhere near the need that's out there, but more importantly than that, uh, women need a permanent, uh, women and kids who have been through this stuff need a permanent solution. They need proper access to housing and an income, and that can only happen through a really decent um reinjection of resources into public and social housing, uh, the proportion of which has been dra dropping drastically over the decades in Australia, and that's why we're in the sorry position we are in terms of housing 
Um, in terms of incomes, we know that um, we know that welfare payments have uh, absolutely not kept up with cost of living, in particular the cost of housing, and these are areas that any government that was taking this stuff seriously would be immediately turning to. But uh, that's why we know that they're not taking this seriously and that's why we know that we need to keep getting out there on the streets. Taking the question further, I also asked Sue Bolton to explain the Socialist Alliance's view that equality for women, or in other words, raising the status of women, is needed to eliminate sexual violence. I think it's true we do need to raise the status of women. Um, now, some people think women already have high status because they see, do see women CEOs and women bosses and so forth in society now. I mean, they're not equal numbers um, because, you know, uh, otherwise, you know, you wouldn't have um, all of these statistics which shows there's not equal numbers. But the fact that there might be women bosses and women CEOs does not mean that women are equal. And in fact, even those women bosses and women CEOs, because of their position under capitalism, they are trying to screw working class people and workers, um, regardless of whether they're male or female. So the, number of C the fact that women CEOs exist and women bosses exist and women politicians exist and some women political leaders such as premiers or um, prime ministers have existed does not mean that women have equality. And for women, women's status to truly be elevated, we do need to deal with all of these, um, all of these um, economic issues, um, you know, raising what we've just said, raising women's income on, cent uh, especially women who exist on Centrelink, whether it's job seeker or, um, you know, single parents pension, etc., needs to be raised above the poverty line. Women need to have access to safe, secure housing. So we ne desperately need a massive expansion of public housing and not leave housing to the market. We need to stop um, the outsourcing and privatisation of services. We need, um, we need, you know, safe services and adequate services for women to be able to access when they're experiencing, uh, or uh, you know, domestic violence. We need um, to reverse this situation where women are penalised for taking time out of the workforce to care for members of the family or are forced to um, survive on part-time jobs or low-paid jobs. Um, we need to stop the penalising of women for taking time out of the workforce. Um, we also need to increase massively the wages of women in who women workers well all the workers who are doing caring jobs which are usually majority women but men who do those jobs are also affected by it but especially women um, we need to raise the wages of aged care workers child care workers um, you know early education workers we need to raise the wages of all of these people to the levels of other workers in society, such as, you know, similar to teachers, um, because these are all highly skilled jobs. Um, they're not babysitting jobs, they're highly skilled jobs. And that all of those elements are keeping women down. And that's what we, we need for women to be able to have an equal status in society. Women have to have equal choices um, to everybody else. Since Sue Bolton is running again for the Mary Beck Council in the October election, I asked her to explain what she thought the role of local government uh, could be in this area. Well, I think in the council arena, like any other political arena, we need to actually fight for the sorts of policies that actually do something tangible for women's rights 
women's status in society. And that doesn't just mean electing more female councillors. You can have female councillors who are really right wing, who um, don't give a stuff about working class women. Um, a lot of councils have gender equity policies and so forth, but um, often a lot of their policies are passed by state and federal government and local councils, often very superficial and um, sort of tick a box and, and very superficial. Obviously, it's better that those policies exist than don't exist, but any um, socialist councillor who is committed to women's rights um, needs to fight for real tangible um, tangible outcomes for women um, so that women have real choices and you know aren't forced into subservient positions because of their economic status. When I asked Sue if she had any final comments, this is what she said. I'd say one more thing which people are often really unaware of is that the unpaid labour of women is accounts for something in the order of 60% of the nation's GDP. If the capitalist system had to actually pay women to do all of the work that they do unpaid, that would be a lot of money. That's why capitalism, the system itself, ha and, and the capitalist class, the owners of the big corporations, have an interest in women continuing to provide for free. And that's why, you know, one of the things that privatisation causes, it's a way of passing the buck to a member of the family unit who considers that they've got a responsibility to give up work or take low paid part time work in order to care for other members of, of a family unit. And that is, that's where capitalism actually has an interest in maintaining a situation where women are subservient. They're totally happy to have a few CEOs and a few um, women CEOs and women bosses and women politicians and women political leaders, but they do not want working class women to have equal rights because it's a cost of the capitalist system. But the system should pay for women to have equal rights. I wanted to give the final word in this episode to Nicole Madigal, who said the government actually does know how to listen. That the government does know how to listen. It all depends on who's doing the talking. Following the stabbing of a Sydney bishop this year, state governments urgently reviewed Australia's approach to knife regulation, with the New South Wales government implementing changes to penalties almost immediately. And let's not forget the swift action taken, as Larissa Ward has pointed out before, following the tragic deaths of Thomas Kelly, David Kasai and Daniel Christie, killed by what we now know of as power punches. Their heartbroken parents' incredible activism resulted in both legal and cultural change. Perpetrators were no longer kings, but cowards, and risked significantly higher penalties. And yet women keep being murdered. On average, one woman loses her life to male violence every four days. They are killed in their homes and in their cars. They are killed seeking shelter. They are killed in front of their children when they are young and when they are old. They're burnt, they're stabbed, they're shot, they're strangled. And these murders are just the horrific tip of the iceberg. Thousands more women live in daily fear their lives controlled physically, emotionally, and financially. We tell them to leave, but when they do, who is there to protect them? They follow the rules. They turn to a system that all too often blames them for their own abuse. They request ADOs or DDOs, but many women are denied these, often having faced their perpetrators in court, suffering the additional humiliation and trauma of publicly sanctioned systems abuse. Many women are misidentified as perpetrators by a system that doesn't understand the signs of abuse or trauma or doesn't want to. Those who do have ABOs or DBOs know their protection is limited. That the legal system considers non-violent breaches to be minor 
and in many cases there are no consequences to these. But these breaches send a clear message to victims, you can't stop me. We tell women to leave, but when they do, who is there to protect them? What's happening to the women in our country is terrifying, but we must not become complacent. We must not give up. Today, we are demanding increased funding for frontline support services so that women are empowered to leave abusive situations and remain safe when doing so. We also demand police be properly trained to recognise abusive behaviour and the broad spectrum of victim responses to prevent victim blaming and perpetrator misidentification. We must continue to make noise until somebody listens. We must continue to make noise until men stop killing women. Thanks everyone. That brings us to the end of this episode of The Green Left Show. A very special big thank you to Sarah Williams, Sue Bolton and Renee Lees who all agreed to be interviewed uh, for this episode. Also, you might be interested to check out the Green Left News podcast. Uh, check out the podcast in general, but this latest episode in particular has also got coverage of the recent round of national mobilisations against violence against women. As I said at the beginning, if you like the work that we do, please become a Green Left supporter if you're not already. It is the number one way to support our work and to receive the content that we produce. You can also support Green Left on Patreon if that's more to your style. And thanks for watching this episode. We'll see you next time on The Green Left Show.